Hello, I'm Dr. Larry Carnes, and welcome to Books of the Month. We're so glad that you could join us, and we're going to have a very special guest with us, John Killian, Wake of Passover. John, how are you today? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. We want to welcome you to the program. Do us this favor. Introduce yourself to our viewing audience and tell them a little bit about who John is. Okay, well, I'm John Killian. I'm the author of Wake of Passover. And uh, it's pretty much the only novel of its type I've, I've written. You know, I, uh, I, I work uh, it's pretty much a nine to five day life. And uh, I've got some background. I've been in the, uh, the Army National Guard for many years generations <laughs> you know we, uh, we used to call them lifers you telling us you're a lifer john i'm a lifer i've been in since ronald reagan it's just, people people i tell people that and i say yeah, ronald reagan wasn't he on mount rushmore or something you know i'm an old, a little bit of an old timer um but uh you know i started off in uh being trained in military intelligence and gave me uh you know a vantage point a little deeper into how you know, the world works behind the scenes. Yes, yes, exciting. Now, you've written this fascinating book, Wake of Passover. You say something here. Over time, everything changes. Politics, religion, and cultural institutions are founded, grown, and Paris as humanity marches through the centuries as a perpetual work in progress. Then you ask the question, can we deny a similar fate for all that we know and consider sacred today. That's a powerful statement. Speak to us about that. Yeah, you know, one of the goals of the book is not to, to promote an agenda, but invite people to, uh, you know, seek an understanding of things uh, so they can do what, it, what they will. And one of the things I think we ought to understand is like yeah, everything's changing in yes. this world. And, uh, what we're doing today we're not going to be doing tomorrow my kids are doing something different than i'm doing and if you go out a hundred years a thousand years you can bet things are going to be radically different than what we have today absolutely absolutely something powerful throughout the ages the written works of scripture have provided a rich history of ancient people the events of times past as recorded in these texts you say that they reveal that in times they were incomparable to today. These people that lived then, you say that they are nevertheless familiar. Unpack that for us and give us some insight okay. to what your thought was with that. Well, you look back, you know, the people who lived in the time of Moses, the people who lived in the Old Testament, the New Testament, you know, they lived in a completely different world, but they were still human beings. They were still trying to get the job done and take care of their, you know, family, you know, uh, you know, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, they were living in a time when, you know, the, the religion and the government of the day would uh, govern them and there was always a struggle to, you know, deal with the constraints put on them. Yeah. Same as today. And, you know, to, so that's, I think where I'm going with that. Okay. That you could take away all of the modern conveniences. You strip it away. You still have people struggling to be free and also, you know, different forces trying to guide us to be, to live better or maybe trying to take advantage of us. Yes, I think it's so powerful. Wake up Passover. You say religious works are written and read through a prism of faith. How much of the truth navigates the filtration is an open question. Yes. Now that's that's that that's a powerful statement there. Talk to us about that. Oh, you can never rule out ulterior motives ah. and when you have institutionalization of faith you start off with faith and you say when it gets organized and then you know people are uh, able to manipulate it you know to their advantage so 
what's the truth? There's there's always a little bit of a give and a take between the truth and what you want people to believe. Now you spoke a mouthful then, you know, I talk about this, John, and sometimes I tell people, I said, there's a difference between the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the religious system that's been put in place to look like the church. Uh, you, you know, I grew, up, I, grew up in the Catholic, yeah, I grew up in the Catholic church, so wow, preach, yeah. preaching to the crier, choir here. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you mean? Now, 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 now when you say, yeah, so talk to us about that, that statement that you just made. That's a powerful statement. Give us some clarity into that. Well, you know, a lot of them with this book is that people are navigating through their life. They're also uh, navigating uh, through a better understanding. And disillusionment is a path to uh, understanding the truth. Okay. And so there's a lot of disillusion, of course, in the Roman Catholic Church, who has unraveled the, the whole, uh, you know, the pedophilia of yeah. the clergy and that's happening in other organized religions too here you're seeing that uh so when you come through that it, it's hard to buy into the the usual suspects anymore you know so yeah. now you start looking on your own and you're looking other places you know to to find uh you there's still a need i think for guide guidance and spiritual guidance as you go in this mm. world uh you gotta be careful who you trust that is powerful you spoke volumes there you spoke volumes now how do we from your perspective because you you you, you you've written this fascinating book what steps do we need to take in order to foster healing in people who have become victims of the things that you just spoke about and to reestablish trust when people are still dealing with the struggles that come with everyday life. Well, a lot of this book is about establishing doubts. I said your job is to establish trust. You know, I have a that's that's hard. If I knew that, you know, I'd be on the other side of the camera, right? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Again, I don't really propose an agenda in this thing. I invite people to find it on their own. Um, but yeah, as far as healing, uh, I think one of the things these people found in, in themselves, this, this man and a woman, it's ultimately a love story, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we find we find comfort in one another and making connections. I think one of the things that we get wrong in modern society is we're trying to get more square footage or a faster car and all this stuff. But really what's going to make your life more worthwhile, you know, I'm a I'm a registered nurse. I've been on an oncology floor. I've seen people who would, you know, gladly trade that car in that yeah. house to get up out of that bed and walk down the hallway yeah, for a man. little bit more time and just having connections with people, having now, a good connection with people. That should be the priority, you know? Yeah. Like when you play on the sports, you play your kid plays on a sports team. It's all about having friendships with these kids more than some, I don't know, some trophy at the end of the season. Who cares? That's powerful. I call that relational capital. How yeah, much relational capital do we have? We do we have invested? Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Building yeah, bridges. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking here. You said the book takes us on a journey through time to a point in the future when all that exists today has suffered from the enacting toll time takes on the works of mere mortals. Nothing humans create, believe, or otherwise conceive stands this test of time. That's a very interesting and powerful statement. Talk to us about that. Uh, you know, it's interesting when Columbus sailed to the New World, and a lot of people thought the world was flat. Yeah. Well, centuries before in Africa, you know, they had walked from, you know, basically Aswan to Alexandria because they knew that the shadow of the light was different here on the solstice than there. So they understood that the world was round many centuries before, just by observing the shadows, how it fell on a certain day. Ma, ma, ma. So, the, so, so they knew that, but century over centuries, that knowledge was lost or not transferred. So it's kind of like a use it or lose it. 
So we think we got this age of enlightenment, but it could go away if we don't do a good job, you know, if our kids aren't hitting their books, if we're not teaching them the right, you know, um, ignorance can grow up on you. Mm. Say that down. again. Say that so, again. So ignorance can, ignorance can grow, grow on a society and it can tear down all the institutions of knowledge. My, you know, my, through my. disuse. So you go long enough in the future, there's no guarantee we're all going to have this uh, perfect understanding. You know, yeah. science may wane. Now, when you said that ignorance, a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, a lack of being aware can grow on you, that speaks volumes. Wow. Because I'm not aware of it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. You see a lot of people out there. They're comfortably numb, you know? Mm. That is and, so, so powerful. And then you might, might want to look in the mirror because I think we all are to some degree. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what would be if there was something, let's say one or two takeaways, key pointers that you would want people to know as they go to purchase this powerful book. Give us a couple of key pointers that you want people to, to know about. Well, you know, as far as the book, you know, I wrote this book primarily because I want to give people something they would enjoy reading. Okay. And, you know, there's maybe a fair share of humor. There's maybe some suspense and there's some, but I uh, think mostly it gives you something to think about wow. on your own. Okay. So you know, thought. yes, yeah, it's like kind of you can meditate, you can stop and you can read a few pages at a time. It's a good book while you're waiting in the DMV. You can read one chapter while you're waiting and then, you know, maybe not pick it up right away. You don't have to read it all the way through. You might yes. want to, you know, but you might want to just read it all and start to think about, geez, how, how do these people in this very different world, they don't have technology and all this stuff. How are they just, how are, am I experiencing the same thing they're going through? That's powerful. And we want um, people to think about that. L listen, take 45 seconds, tell people information about yourself, website, email, how they can get in touch with you. Okay. Oh, I don't have a good site. I think you would just have to Google Wake of Passover. Okay. And you'll get the book. You might get my site there to help people out. Uh, uh, but I think that's the, the number one. If you just go check out the book, Wake a Passover. Okay, excellent. And uh, you'll find a way to get in touch with me there. Awesome. Uh, you can send me an email. I don't know. I don't. I used to send an email to John at Killian.com with one L. John at Killian.com. John at John at Killian.com with one L. Okay. Not like the beer. beer. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, well, done. John, we want to thank you for being our guest today. Thank you, and thank you for this fascinating book that's going to provoke thought, give people insight, and to look let them look from a different perspective. Thank you so much for being with us today. All right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I'm Dr. Larry Carnes. Thank you for joining us for Books of the Month. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.